everyone. Welcome to First Bible Church. I'm Janelle, and we're so glad you're here to worship with us today. First Bible is one church in two locations, Madison and Decatur, Alabama. Our mission is to glorify God by helping people know, love, obey, and exalt Jesus Christ. We do this as we gather together in corporate worship, grow in community groups, and go in service for the gospel. While our current circumstances of our world have required us to implement new tactics, our strategy is still to gather, grow, and go. If you're visiting with us in person or by watching our online service today, we'd love to connect with you further by sending you more information about First Bible Church. You can help us do this by filling out a Connect card in person at the Hub or by clicking the link below in our YouTube description. You can also follow us on social media to stay connected. Whether it's your first time worshiping with us or you've been visiting for a while, the best way to find out more about First Bible Church is to join us in Discover FBC. This is a one hour class where you'll learn more about our church and how to get connected here. Our next Discover FBC will be held October 4th. You can register in person at the Hub or email us at hub at fbc.org. Church family, September 20th begins the next phase of our church's reopening plan. This will be the first Sunday of services held at the new Madison campus, as well as the start of ABF's student ministry and children's ministry. If you're not currently part of an ABF, now is a great time to join one. We have online and in-person options, and you can email us at hub at fbc.org for more information. Our fall women's Bible studies are still open for registration, but they're filling up quickly, so be sure to register as soon as possible to ensure that you get a spot. Classes begin September 15th. And finally, the morning of prayer will be held September 12th at both campuses from 8 till 11.30 a.m. When we consider the gravity of all that's taking place in our community and culture, now more than ever it is important to refocus and practice the discipline of humility through prayer. Join us on September 12th for this important event. If you have any questions about anything happening at First Bible Church, feel free to email us at hub at fbc.org. That's all from us. Have a great week. Great to see you all this morning as we have come together to worship those who are with us here in the building and also those who are joining us online. Our call to worship is from Isaiah 25. Let's stand together for our call to worship. Oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. Let's sing holy, holy, holy.
Good morning, kids. I'm Mr. Barry. Our missionaries of the month are Tio and Madalina Cavaco. The Cavacos serve in Portugal and have been first Bible missionaries for many years. They have helped start a church in an area that doesn't have any strong churches. We will be praying for them in a moment, and you and your family can pray for the Cavacos this week. All year, we've been studying God's plan throughout the Bible. Last week, we looked at God's power over false gods at Mount Carmel. After this, Elijah traveled to Mount Horeb, where God instructed Elijah to anoint a man named Elisha to take over after him as prophet. Elijah found Elisha plowing a field. He put his cloak, which is kind of like a robe, over Elisha to show him that he would be a prophet like he was. Elisha followed Elijah and served him for many years. When the time came for the Lord to take Elisha up to heaven, he and Elisha traveled to Gilgal. At Gilgal, Elijah said, Elisha, stay here. The Lord is sending me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as long as you are alive, I will not leave you. So they went together to Bethel. God told Elijah to travel to two more places and each time, Elisha said the same thing. As long as you are alive, I will not leave you. At last, they went to the Jordan River. At the river, Elijah did something really cool. He took his cloak and he folded it together and struck the water with it. The river divided and Elijah and Elisha went across on dry ground. In his final moments, Elijah told Elisha, tell me what I can do before I leave. Elisha asked for the power to continue God's work like Elijah had done, and he wanted a sign that he would be Israel's next prophet. Elijah told him, if you see me go, you will have it. Then something amazing happened. A chariot of fire and horses suddenly appeared and separated the men. Elijah dropped his cloak as he went up to heaven in a whirlwind and Elisha watched him go. Elisha picked up the cloak and went back to the river. He hit the water and it parted for him to cross to the other side, just as it had for Elijah. The crowd of prophets was there watching and they saw that the power that was with Elijah was now with Elisha. God gave Elisha the same spirit that was with Elijah so he could carry out his mission as a prophet. Years later, Jesus told his followers to wait for the Holy Spirit. God gives believers his spirit so that we can grow closer to Christ and share the good news of Jesus with people who don't know him. Jesus told us that apart from him, we can't do anything. And that's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. Now, let's continue praising God as we worship him together. Have a great week. Well, as Barry mentioned, our missionaries of the week are the Cavacos, and I encourage you as the Lord brings them to mind throughout the week to pray for them, and uh, let's pray for them and a few other things right now. Father God, you are holy, 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 merciful and mighty, and it's that mercy and grace uh, by which we can even gather together as your people and lift up these requests. We Come before you and the, to the throne of grace. It is nothing that we earned, uh, not by our merit. We never could. And by your grace, uh, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be the great high priest, to um, live a perfect life, to be tempted in every way as we are, and yet as uh, the holy sacrifice, perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty that we deserve for our sin. And this gospel is why we gather to uh, sing your praises, hear your word preached, to fellowship with one another, and also to focus on taking that gospel to uh, the city of Decatur, Madison, our country, and the entire globe, and 
So that's why we, it's our privilege to be able to support and partner with missionaries like the Cavacos. We pray, give you thanks that uh, you have protected them during this time of the pandemic. Uh, we praise you for these three girls who have trusted Christ and recently been baptized and do ask that you would help them to grow in their Christian life and in, in their faith. Uh, pray too for guidance and wisdom as they make ministry plans during this time uh, with the pandemic and their church and restrictions, additional restrictions that are in place. And finally, I, I pray, Father, for uh, their grandson and pray for his return to school and for uh, their family, possibly, that you would provide, carve out some time that they could uh, have some time to vacation and to replenish and refuel for the uh, ministry year ahead. Father, we pray for uh, members of our congregation and uh, thank you for this church body and, and we look forward to the time ahead in these next few weeks as we gear up for uh, opening a new campus in Madison and pray for our preparation for beginning in our adult Bible fellowships, our, our women's ministry, our children's ministry, student ministry. Uh, give us your wisdom as we prepare and uh, pray for any members of our church body who may be struggling or suffering. I pray, I pray for my friend Larry Irwin as he recovers from his procedure and help him get healed up quickly. And Father, we, we lift up all these requests um, and we pray that in a few moments as Steve preaches your word that you would open our eyes to the beauty of your law and um, incline our hearts to obey your statutes. And we lift up these requests in Christ's name, amen. And you'll notice too, um, the slide that's come up here, the Pre-COVID, this would be the time in our worship service where we worship the Lord through our giving, uh, but due to health restrictions, there won't be any plates being passed now, but there are opportunities that you'll notice the uh, basket in the back, and if you're watching online, the slides have opportunities, instructions for ways to give online as well. If you're visiting with us this morning, uh, don't feel obligated to give. Uh, we just want to thank our members for so many months your faithfulness has allowed us to continue ministering to our congregation and our city and, and as well to be able to continue supporting our missionaries like the, like the Cavaco. So we want to thank you and give thanks to the Lord as well. Let's continue to worship. We've all sinned this week in things unknown and unknown. Let's stand together as we sing song of confession. Lord, have mercy.
Good morning to those of you who are in this room and also those of you who are joining us now on uh, live stream as we have come together again to open up God's Word. He has heard from us these last few minutes in our prayers and in our singing. And in these next few minutes, we're going to hear from him as he speaks to us in and through his Word together. It doesn't take long as you're reading through the Bible, uh, even if you've not read it for very much of your life to figure out that the Bible is filled with all kinds of commands. And uh, in fact, some people have counted these and by different counts, some come to about 613 commandments in the Old Testament, over a thousand in the New Testament, well over 1,500 commandments. Some of them are repeated commands, but I think we can safely say well over 1,500 commandments in all of the Bible. And, uh, and so that's a lot of commandments and to keep them all straight is a difficult thing. And so Jesus kind of made it easy for us because one day a man asked him uh, what the greatest commandment is, and his response was uh, very clear. He says, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength in Matthew 22. That's his response, the greatest commandment. What does it mean to love someone? To love someone means that you uh, intentionally think and act and do the things that are in their best interest. It means that you seek your happiness in their happiness. You're happy when they're happy. And so you do the things that make them happy and that makes you happy. Because if you love someone, you want them to be happy. And we can bring God pleasure. God is perfectly content and happy in himself. He doesn't need us. But the Bible does say that we can please him. We can bring God pleasure by the way we live our lives and uh, by the way we keep those commandments that he gives. So, so when we love God, what it means is to, to seek him, to know him, to obey him, to, to seek his happiness and his glory and to draw other people to him and attention to him. And, and in, in fact, if you think about the, the Ten Commandments, the first commandment is uh, very clear that it says, you shall have no other gods before me. So it's very similar. In other words, take it all together, what you find in the Bible is that what God is, is telling us to do is putting him first, put him in that top spot above all things, that God is in the top spot, to acknowledge that he is in the top spot, that he is over and above all things, and that he is the most important, he is the most important person there is. And someone might say, well, 
why would God do that? Or how does God do that? Well, first of all, what is the command? To love him with all our heart. And uh, secondly, what does that mean? It means to, to live our lives intentionally to please him, to bring him pleasure. And, and how does God do it? Well, he does it with knowledge. He does it with perfect knowledge. He does it with omniscience. God knows all things, past, present, future. He knows every possible outcome to every possible decision you can make. And he knows with certainty the grief that we cause ourselves and other people when we put gifts in the place of the giver. God the giver is in the top spot, but if we seek to, to make an exchange and replace God in that place with gifts that he has given to us, we're going to cause ourselves grief and sorrow and pain, but also we're going to cause other people grief and sorrow and pain. So why does God give us this command? Because he loves us. He loves us. Someone might say, well, if God says, well, the greatest command is to love him with all of our heart, doesn't that make God self-centered? And the answer to that question would be, yes, it does, absolutely. God is self-centered. He is centered on himself. Without apology, God is the center of all things, and he requires that we acknowledge that he's the center of all things. I mean, someone's got to be at the center. So who do you want there? Your favorite athlete? Your favorite politician? Some preacher, some pastor, you, who's going to be at the center? So someone's got to be there, and God says, I'm at the center. Does that make God egotistical? Is God conceited? And the answer is no, he is not conceited, because conceit is an overestimation of ourself, our character, our competence, our abilities. How's God going, how is God going to overestimate himself? I mean, God says, uh, I know all things. What, you think you're God or something? Yes, I do, God says. I know all things. I can do all things. I cannot, God cannot overestimate himself, therefore God can never be conceited. Self-centered, yes, because that's the reality, but not conceited. And in love he says that he has that top spot in our life, and we're to acknowledge that, and he does that for us, he gives us that command to us because we, he loves us and we're called to love him. So what happens when we don't? Well, we'll cause ourselves grief, will cause other people grief. And you say, well, God's the only one to be qualified to be at the center. I mean, think about it this way. If you, if you had a five-year-old daughter and you're driving in the car and you're on Beltline and you've been running errands and your five-year-old daughter says, okay, it's my turn to drive. And you say to her, no, it's not your turn to drive. And she says, well, you've been driving the whole time. That's not fair. It's my turn to drive. Uh, do you think you're the center of, of, of all things? Do you think you're the most important person in this car? And your answer would be, well, yes, I do. You are in the top spot in that car, and you are requiring, you are insisting that your daughter acknowledge you are in the top spot because you love her. You want what's best for her. And when God requires us to love him more, to love him most, to put him in that top spot, he is doing this because he loves us. And by the way, that's the most loving thing we can do for other people. The best way that you can love your wife is to love Christ more. The best way you love your husband is to love Christ more. The best way to love your children is to love Christ more. The best way to love your country is to love Christ more. He calls us to love him first, to love him most, that he is more important, that he is, he is the object of our treasuring and our value because he loves us. So in this text this morning, we looked a little bit at this last week that there are five vices here that he says that this used to be a part of your life, but now it's not to be a part of your life. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, where we left off last week, and this is what it says in verse 3, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Now, last week, we, I, I, we warned the parents ahead of time it was going to be PG sermon, so uh, I, I was a little bit more direct last week. So we looked at three of these vices that are in a category. Instead of those words, I'll use the, the phrase uh, sensual pleasures, and most of you will know what I'm talking about when I say that. But I want to look at the other two vices. So there's two categories. There's one with sensual pleasures, and the other two categories are what I'll call chemical pleasures, chemical pleasures, drunkenness, orgies. And, and the thing is that, that when God gives us these things, these are often gifts that, that in themselves, if we use them right, that God is pleased with these things. I mean, chemicals are a gift. 
mean, think of all the chemicals that, that, what would we do without chemicals? Water is a chemical, salt, sodium chloride is a chemical, sugar, sucrose, fructose is a chemical. And every day we sit down and we eat meals and, and we're putting into our bodies, we're putting into chemicals. Wine contains several chemicals and one of the featured chemicals, of course, is ethanol, the result of fermentation. Is wine a gift from God? Is, is beer a gift from God? Is alcohol a gift from God? Many Christians are quick to say it is a gift from God. And there are two reasons why they would say it. One is as you look through Scripture, it's pretty clear that God gives these things as a gift. One of the reasons would be that we in this age take our water for granted, pure drinking water for granted everywhere we go. Uh, you, you can go to the tap, you can, you can buy, you know, how many little plastic bottles of water do you think you bought through the years? Every, we have easy access to clean water, but not then. And so in, in that world, and for centuries this was the case, that in order to kill some of those pathogens, it was often mixed with wine. And so one of the reasons that this is a gift from God, it's, this is why Paul said to Timothy, to take a little wine for your stomach. Another is just simply the pleasure that comes from it. And so, therefore, Jesus drank wine, and the apostles drank wine, and the patriarchs drank wine. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob drank wine. So, other Christians look at this, and they ask the question, well, is wine a gift? And they would say, no. And they would point to all the warnings in Scripture, and there are more warnings probably about drinking alcohol than there are uh, verses that extol the use of it. And so they would say, look at these warnings, and look at the examples in Scripture, and look at from Noah onward what happens to people who drink too much. And that's the key, who drink too much. In fact, this word here in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, when it says drunkenness is a compound word of the word wine in the Greek plus the word bubble up. And so it means bubbling up, wine that's bubbling up, overflowing, excessive. In other words, what he's saying is you're drinking too much. That's what this means, not drinking at all. And so taken together, you take all the scripture. There are two options for the believer. One is to drink in very, very much of a sense of moderation, and, and what that is is diff, you know, different for everybody to, to determine. All the, the U.S. Department of Health is now saying one drink a day for men and for women, one drink a day max, well, whatever that means. So that would be an option. Or abstaining totally from alcohol would be an option. There's no verse in the Bible that commands you to drink it. But here's, here's what we're not free to do. This is very important. We're not free to drink too much. We're not free to drink to excess. We're not free to drink to the point of intoxication or being under the influence of alcohol. And over and over again, you see this in Scripture that this is the command of God to us and the warning of God to us. I want to look at, uh, we could look at several verses, but I just want to bring something in from outside from the book of Ephesians. This is what Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. By the way, Ephesians is within the group of churches that Peter is writing to in Asia Minor. And, and this is in Ephesus. And he says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Do not get drunk. Don't drink to excess. Why? Because that's debauchery. It's a waste and instead, he says, be filled with the Spirit. And notice the contrast that these two are in competition. The reason is, if you're drunk with wine, you're under the influence of wine. And, and the under the influence of alcohol leads you, gives you a propensity toward unloving behavior. I mean, guys don't get together in their frat house and say, hey, let's get drunk and then go down to the nursing home and help people out. That's not what they say. I, I've never had anyone say to me, you know, our marriage is really, really bad until my husband started drinking and that really straightened things out. It's been great ever since. I've never heard an employer say, I have an employee who had a lot of temp, but, but, and they used to be late to work and unreliable, but now, man, they are really producing ever since they started drinking. That's not what you hear. And so the drunkenness, the, the, the over-drinking leads to unloving conduct, unloving words, but what does the Holy Spirit do? If you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. So you, if you're under the influence of, of alcohol, you're not going to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You've got to decide. can't be both. And so this warning is, is giving, given here. To make us more like Christ, it's under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So 
when this competition happens, you, you notice, for example, if, if you talk to any police officer, 40% of all violent crimes are related to alcohol as well. Now, how, do you, how much is too much? When are you having a problem with it? When, when have we gone or passed the line? There are classic signs for this and people who work as counselors and uh, in the area of helping people who are uh, dependent on alcohol and have a problem with it have noticed several. Let me give you a few ideas about what I'm talking about. One is if you're hiding. Not only hiding your alcohol in places where other people can't find it, but uh, hiding yourself. Uh, disengaging more and more from friends and family and activities that you used to be involved in. So hiding, hiding I talked to a friend of mine who's a recovering alcoholic, and he said, you know, even after I was sober for a year or two, I kept finding bottles. So hiding it, lying about it, lying to yourself about the problem, denial, one of the key classic symptoms. Everybody else can see it, but you can't see the problem. And then lying to other people about how much you've had to drink, about where you've been. Drinking alone. Drinking during the daytime, especially while you're on the clock, or drinking before the evening. Drinking to deal with stress and anxiety and problems and depressions. Maybe you've got a meeting or you've got a crisis that's come up, and you say, well, that's going to be really hard. I'm going to have to drink something to help me get through that. Now notice, you got something coming up that makes you anxious, and what's, what's the go-to? Well, to, to take a drink, to settle me down. But what does the Bible say? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So to replace prayer and going to God with the drinking is a problem. That's a, that's a sign that it's moved into a, a place in your life that it shouldn't be. Drink until you lose your memory saying and doing things in, in the nighttime and then the next morning you can't remember it, you start to repeat yourself. Tolerance, what, what only took one beer now takes two. What, three beers now takes a couple of glasses of wine, building up a tolerance to it. When drinking becomes a priority, when your schedule is starting to work around it, you plan your day around it, your work schedule, you begin to drift away from relationships and it's important to you as you plan out your day. You wake up in the morning maybe even thinking about it. And then finally, it's causing problems in your relationships, usually first of all in your marriage and then with other people in your life. It'll start to cause problems with your health. People say, I'm gonna drink so I can, this will help me sleep, but it doesn't. It actually interferes with your deepest sleep, the sleep where you get the most rest. And drinking excessively also brings down your immune system. So if drinking is causing problems in your life, you probably got a drinking problem. And it needs to be considered in all of this. This is, what, this is what Peter's saying to the church here in Asia Minor. This is what he's saying. This is the way you used to do it. You used to go to alcohol for these needs and to meet these things in your life. But now he's saying, go somewhere else. This is, this is what we want to do as we look at this. You say, well, what about other things? Because somebody's sitting there thinking, I don't have a problem with drinking. I don't know anybody who does. And, and you're thinking, okay, this is going to be one of those sermons that's about other people, but it's not. So hold on. Here's what I, what I want you to consider. What holds the top spot in your life? What do you love most? What do you care about most? What do you think about most? What are you most enthusiastic about? What, what do you think about? What do you treasure most? What do you value most? What is it for you? The greatest commandment says that we're to love Him most, want Him most, treasure Him most, long to be with Him most. But what is it for you? So this last couple of days as I've been thinking about this, I decided to write down a list of idols Usually good things, good gifts that God gives to us, but we take the gifts and then we elevate them to the point that they're more important to us than the giver himself. This is based on my personal experience and also a lot of years in ministry helping other people. We can make an idol out of money, education, grades, sports, career, marriage, husbands, wives, children, grandchildren, hobbies, Cycling, running, hunting, fishing, golfing, boating, skiing, bikes, got that in twice, 
home decorating, home improvement, sports, SEC football, travel ball, the approval of others, ministry, fitness, weightlifting, politics, politicians, pastors, professors, presidents, boyfriends, girlfriends, clothes, home improvements, food, diets, the government, drink, beer, wine, Jack Daniels, marijuana, opioids, methamphetamines, sleep, Netflix, travel, vacations, motorcycles, ATVs, boats, cars, trucks, the environment, trees, pets, dogs, cats, the United States, the flag of the United States, celebrities, musicians, athletes, coaches, computers, smartphones, social media, church buildings, ministry, I bet you probably could add a few things to that. I, I had a meeting Monday, and uh, I left the meeting, left for the meeting, and I left my, I left my cell phone. And uh, I got halfway there, and I realized that I had left my cell phone, and I, I actually thought I need to turn around and go get, I, I'm going to be late to the meeting, but I need to turn around and go get that. And I thought, no, i got to make this meeting. And so I thought, I'm just going to leave it at home. I can do fine without it. But what if I break down? I thought to myself, oh, I'll have to depend on the kindness of strangers. Oh, but what if someone wants to reach me? Steve, you're not that important. And then i got to get gas after I have this meeting because I'm on fumes. And usually now when I get gas, as the gas is pumping in the tank, what am I doing? Man, well, well, I'm going to scroll through here, text messages, emails, checking everything. Y'all, I went 90 minutes without my cell phone. And I thought, it's amazing the place this has begun to take in my life. He said, well, is it, I don't know if it's an idol or not, but I know this. I wish I was upset about being distant from God for 90 minutes as I was upset about being distant from this. John Calvin said that our hearts are perpetual idol factories. We're constantly pumping out idols. Good things, bad things, gifts from God he wants us to enjoy. Often the times they take more of a position in our life than, the, than, than they should have, that they warrant. And so... I want to talk about three things to do about it. First of all, consider what an idol is. An idol is anything or anyone more important to us than God. Anything or anyone more important to us than God. Is there anything or anyone more important to you than God this morning? First thing to do is to recognize idolatry, to identify any created thing which you attempt to put in God's place and to trust in your present and eternal or eternal happiness. Just recognize it in your life. It's easy, you know, the external things, we think of the obvious things, statues, gold and silver. I don't bow down to statues of gold and silver. I'm not an idolater, but, but actually the scripture warns us that these things are not just external, but they're actually internal. They start in the heart, which is why Colossians 3, 5 and 6 says, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, and evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. The covetousness, the de desire, the longing, the yearning for things outside of God's will for you, the, it starts in the heart. It starts there where no one else can see. No one can see you bowing down in your heart to these idols in your life. So I wanna ask seven questions and, and ask you to be honest with yourself in the next few minutes. Number one, are you willing to part with it in order to obey God? What are the most important things? You think of things, people, activities, hobbies, interests that are in your life that are really important to you. Are you willing to part with it in order to obey God? What if God asked you to give that up? Would you be willing to give it up? As the Apostle Paul said, in order to advance the gospel, I'm willing to become all things to all men. I'll give up my rights. I'll give up my privileges. I'll give up whatever God wants me to give up. They might be, other people might be entitled to those things. Other Christians might enjoy those things. But because of the advance of the gospel, because God wants me to, I'll, I'll give it up. Can, can you think of yourself like that? That you're, you're willing to give these things up to the Lord? Another question to think about is, is money. Um, that's, that's one of the things that would go for first. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, is what Paul says to Timothy. You say, well, I don't love money. How do I know if I love money? Well, let me ask you a question. What are you willing to do to gain it? 
What are you doing, willing to do to retain it? Are you willing to lie, to cheat, to deceive, to be unethical in business? You, you say, well, no, I, I don't do any of those things. Well, what, what about, do you think that God gave you all, the money, all that money just for you can keep it to yourself? Remember the people of Malachi? And, and the prophet says that you have robbed God, and the people say, we, how have we robbed God? And God comes back through the prophet, he says, you've robbed me in withholding your tithes and your offerings. How do you know if you love money? You're holding on to money that God doesn't want you to hold on to. How do you know if you don't love money? You're willing to give it up. Are you willing to part with it, whatever it is, in order to obey God? Secondly, can you imagine your life without it? Or you might say to yourself, if I, did, if I had to give that up, I'd just die. I'd, life would not be worth living. Really? Is Jesus not enough? Is he not sufficient for us? Number three, does it receive an appropriate amount of your time and money? God wants us to enjoy his gift. First Timothy 6 says that God given us, has given us these things all to, for our enjoyment. So enjoy your watermelon, enjoy your steak, enjoy your, the things that God has given you. My, my uh, wife and children gave me a Santa Cruz mountain bike for my 60th birthday a few months ago, and I'm telling you, man, I love that thing. I enjoy it. I was just on it a couple days ago. I enjoy it very, very much. And yet, and yet the gifts of God that we can enjoy, if we're not careful, can become dominant in our life. Next question, does it fill your heart with humility and gratitude toward God? That, because, okay, God wants you to enjoy these gifts. I mean, it's not like if you are a parent and you give your child a, a present for their birthday, and, uh, and they come to you with a present in their hand and they say, oh, it's not the gift, it's the giver. I just, I, you're more important to me than this gift. And they throw your gift in the trash and they don't enjoy it. That doesn't make you happy. As a parent, you want your children to enjoy the gifts that you give them. And God wants us to enjoy gifts. I enjoy my bikes. I, I enjoy my truck. That, that truck? So often I'm in that truck as I'm driving down the road thinking, Lord, I love this truck. Thank you for this truck. Because that truck came from God through you and it makes me mindful of you and I give thanks for you. And, and so if the gifts of God cause you to turn to God in thanksgiving and gratitude and humility, it's probably not an idol in your life. But if the gifts of God cause you to turn your back on God and you no longer have time for him because you're too busy playing with the toys he's given you, it's probably become an idol. So does it fill your heart with humility and gratitude toward God? Is it improving the, the quality of your relationships? Look at the most important relationships that God has called, to you, called, you, called you to in your life, the vocation of marriage and family. Is your hobby in, interfering with that? Is your drinking interfering with that? Those are the kinds of questions that you have to ask. Number seven, do you get defensive when someone questions your relationship to it? Oh, I'm sorry, number six, is it a secondary source of comfort after Scripture and prayer? What, what's your first go-to? God wants to comfort you through his gifts, but not apart from him, but to go to him first to find in the God's word and through praying his comfort and his peace. And then finally, do you get defensive when someone questions your relationship to it? It might be in a sermon. It might be this sermon. Might, some of these sermons might make you mad because I, ask yourself, why are you getting defensive? Uh, if someone comes to you, a friend, and says to you, you know, I've seen this in your life, I'm a little concerned about this, are you going to get defensive? Or are you going to say, oh, oh, Lord, is, is, this, is this achieving a position in my life where it should not have, a hold on my life, an obsession with my thoughts and my enthusiasm and my joy and my energy and my time and my money that it should not have? Do you get defensive when someone questions you about it? So that's what we do. We, we, first of all, we've got to recognize it in our life. And then secondly, then we renounce it. We renounce our, our, idolat our, our idolatry. And, and so what that means is that with your mouth and from your heart, you declare allegiance to Christ alone. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and, and this, this is what it says in verse 9, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Notice what happens here. The gospel comes in, and they turn to God. So they're going this way. They're going toward their idols, they're going toward the gifts of God, and, and they're moving in this direction away from God. And then they hear the gospel, and they come to Christ. Now they've turned to Christ, and as they're moving toward God, what did they have to do? They had to turn their back on idols. They had to renounce their idols. You can't have both. That's the point. 
You can't have God and your idols. God will not share that top spot with anything or anyone. You have to turn from them in order to turn to God. And so we declare our allegiance to Christ alone. So you declare that, and then you declare it to others, to friends you trust, to your small group, to, to people that in your life, your family members who can hold you accountable and pray for you, that you confess your sin and you say, you know, I've been putting too much energy and time and, and valuing this thing, this person in my life too much, and I want to turn from that, and I want to turn to God alone. But also you confess it to God. Confess it to God. You come to Him and you say, Lord, I want to renounce these things. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. And so we turn from it, and then we say to God, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. Show me. Listen. Show me the idols of my heart. Show me where I've loved anything or anyone more than you, where I've put you first. Show me what's keeping me from the love for you that you have called me to, to love you with all my heart and soul, mind, and strength. Lord, will you show me these things in my life that I need to change, that I need to repent of? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Or are you afraid? Are you afraid to ask God that question because he might ask you to give up something? He might ask you to turn your back on something. He might ask you to move forward without that thing that has meant so much to you, without that relationship that has meant so much to you. God might call you to, are you willing to say to him, Lord, show me what it is. Search me. Know me. And then finally, after we recognize it, we recognize it, we renounce the idolatry, and then we run from it. We run from it. Motivated by love for Christ, we plan and execute strategies for destroying idolatry in your heart. Lord, I don't want idolatry in my heart. We run from it. I, 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 I want to put distance between me and my idol. How do I do that? Well, well you've got to have a plan. You've got, to exec- you've got to have a strategy, and you've got to execute that strategy. You, you, you plan your work, and you work your plan. So what's your plan? This is why he says in 1 Peter, in this verse, in chapter 4, verse 3, he says, drinking parties. What's wrong with the parties? Lord, I'm just going to, now drinking party is where the main event is drinking, all right? Doesn't mean just some event where there's going to, there might be something served. It just means you're getting together to drink and there's going to be excess. He says, don't go to the parties. Why, Lord? I'm not going to drink. Those are my friends. I used to run with them all the time. Now I'm a Christian. They need me. I got to be a witness, you know. Don't go to the drinking parties. Why? You ever go to the drinking party and not drink? Everybody's either buzzed or hammered, and you're not, and they're moving out of reality into some other zone, and you're still in reality. That's just not much fun. You're going to stay there like that? No, usually what's going to happen is you either have to leave or you got to join in. And so he says, that's not what you do anymore. You, you remove yourself from the idol. You put distance between. This is why it says, to the, when, when Paul writes the church at Corinth, And he's writing to that church in 1 Corinthians 10 about temptation because what they said was, yeah, we used to go to these parties and worship these idols and all this stuff, but we're Christians now and we're strong and we have the Holy Spirit and we can resist temptation. We're still going to go to these idol worship parties and there's going to be drinking and there's going to be immorality over here, but we're going to say no. And Paul responds in 1 Corinthians 10, says, let him who think he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able But with the temptation, we'll give you a way of escape. And what's the way of escape? He says in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from it. Run from it. Get away from it. So we can make idols of all things. And when when we get this plan, we put this distance between us and our idols, we're saying to God, I want you to be first. Maybe you need to give that hobby a rest. Maybe you need to fast a little bit from social media. Maybe there's some money you need to give away. What's your plan? What's your plan? Struggling with pornography? What's your plan? 
How are you going to put distance between you and that? That thing that has become dominant in your life. What's your plan? Whatever it is. When I was at Dallas Seminary, well, let me just first say this. I was not a good student when I was growing up. And um, in high school, I had friends who were really, really smart. They graduated uh, magna cum laude. I graduated magna cum barely. You know, you've heard that old joke. And it really was true. I barely graduated from high school. Went to college. First two years of college were difficult for me. Really struggled. Uh, and then somewhere, I, sometimes boys take later, longer time to develop. My brain just kind of clicked. And I started getting, and I got my mojo about my junior year of college, and I finally thought, oh, and then I started making better grades. Well, by then it's too late for your GPA. So I graduated from college, no problem. By the way, to all the young people here, ever since that time, no one has ever asked me what my GPA was. So, okay, it's important, but keep it in perspective. Then I went for four years, and I started working as a youth pastor, and then I then I went back to Dallas Seminary, went back to seminary to work on my, my master's degree. Master of Theology is a four-year degree. And about two years into the Master of Theology degree, I, I realized, man, I'm making some really good grades. I never made grades like that in my life. And this is one of the toughest theological institutions there is in the world. I mean, it was known for that. And I thought, man, I'm really doing good here. Had a high GPA. And then they got to the end of uh, the process, and then that's when you have to write your master's thesis. I wrote my thesis. I told my thesis advisor, John Hanna, I said, Dr. Hanna, I really want to do good on this, and, uh, you know, really, I really need your help. And so I, I submitted my thesis to him, and he sent it back to me, and there was red ink. It looked like it was bleeding everywhere. There's red ink here. He said, rewrite it. I said, okay, I'll rewrite it because I wanted to keep that GPA. So I rewrote it, sent it back to him. Only half the red ink came back, and he said, rewrite it. I did this like three or four times. I sent Lori and the kids to visit her parents. If I, I remember I had the whole house for myself. I was just so dominated with this, writing this master's thesis, doing a great job on it, thinking in the back of my mind, oh, I'm sure someone's going to want to publish this, you know, all this kind of stuff. It was, by the way, it's on the doctrine of original sin and the writings of Jonathan Edwards and Charles Chauncey. If you ever have trouble getting to sleep, just ask me. You can borrow it any time, and it'll, set you, it'll put you right to sleep. Got it all done, gave it to Dr. Hannah, and finally I said to him, look, what do I have to do to get out of here? What do I have to do just to graduate? Because now what was so important to me, I, was realized, I realized this, that GPA had become my idol. It became the most important thing in my life. I, I was, it was, it, the idea of pleasing other people was more important to me than pleasing God. My relationships started to suffer. My time, my energy was just over and over again. Jesus is the only one who's never committed idolatry. Never did. And he died in the place of idolaters like you and me. I was a little depressed yesterday afternoon. I worked on this sermon for a while. And then in the afternoon, I worked in the yard. And while you're working in the yard, you got time to think. And I just kept thinking about this. And I realized, God... My wicked heart is filled with idols. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would be lost. God forgives every sin. We confess our sins to Him. He's faithfully just to cleanse us from every sin and all of our unrighteousness. And once again, we come to Him. With Jesus Never committed idolatry, but he did pray, and we need to pray, which is why next Saturday morning we're calling the church to pray, if you can, to join us here, and, and it'll be socially distanced and all of that. But we're going to Madison campus, Decatur campus, and we're just going to seek the Lord, and we're going to ask him, search our hearts as a church, as individuals. Search my heart and seek the Lord. And we're going to close this service with a song that is a prayer. And I want to encourage you to really think about it. As we sing the song together, think about what this means. We're saying this to the Lord as we ask Him to examine our hearts together. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Your Son and our Lord, we give You thanks. For we are idolaters. And every day we are tempted to put some gift that You have given us, some good thing, and misuse it and put it in the place that only you belong in that top spot. I pray to you to help us be mindful this week as we go out to serve you, that we would keep you there 
acknowledge that you are there, that we would love you more, seek you more, treasure you more than anything or anyone. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing, Give Us Clean Hands. bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit come make us humble, we turn our eyes from evil things, oh Lord we cast down our idols, give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. Following the benediction, and you will be dismissed by the ushers. After, a little, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, 
strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.